There might be a lesson to learn from this if I were the kind of guy who could learn lessons. But lessons are not for me. Lessons are for schoolboys. Schoolboys are for me! Red light! Hey, Tatters, it's time for Halloween in November. Sorry, I had stuff mostly derpy gone, but I did record this video on Halloween night. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about American Dead, or more specifically, their scariest episodes. Because American Dead has a got a lot of scary episodes. I agonized for a while about this because there were many many, many episodes to choose from, and I think I finally compiled a list of 11. Yeah, there was one episode I really wanted on the list. However, we gotta lay some ground rules. Probably the main rule is that the episode cannot be a Halloween special. That feels cheap, and American Dad's Halloween episodes aren't that particularly scary. Don't worry, that still leaves us with a lot. And while they can't be Halloween episodes, they can be for any other holiday. So, let's discuss. Here are the top 11 scariest American Dead episodes in honor of Halloween in November. Oh, come on. Fox is airing Treehouse of Horror in November. I think I'm fine. But like always, let's start with the honorable mentions. Now, a little bit of trivia, my all-time favorite American Dad episode is Vision Impossible. The main reason is I remember when it got announced at Comic-Con, and I spent months waiting for it to premiere. Normally, when I wait for an episode or a movie that long, I get hyped. And then I get disappointed when said product does not meet my initially high standards. As was the case with the Barbie movie, sorry, and kind of almost was with FNAF, but I did like that movie. Vision Impossible still met my expectations, if not exceeded them. After a car accident, Roger goes into a coma, and when he wakes up, he develops the power to see the future if he touches the other person in a non-weird way. Roger, you're awake which means you're probably alive. Let's check your vitals. <laughs> and he finds this out when he's in a hospital, where he's hooked up to hoses and wires and presumably also life support, where people can see he probably doesn't have human organs. Okay. While the Smiths are excited by his gift, especially after he saves them from a fire, they quickly wear him thin and become afraid of the future. Until this happens. At least let us come with you! No, you should, you should, you should probably stay here. Are we all gonna die if we come with you? Yes! That! You're all gonna die if you leave the house! And worse yet, Klaus will not get really rich soon. I know, the shock. Originally, I wanted to add the episode to the list because of Act 3's reveal that the Smiths pretty much turned themselves into Grey Gardens, just without being filthy stinking rich. Roger, thank God you're back! Everybody, Roger's back! Oh, Roger, what a relief! We don't have to be scared anymore! Yeah, maybe we can leave the house now! I mean, they almost were, but Stan wanted the sweet 20 grand and not the crap land. And if Roger died, they likely would have stayed this way for the rest of their lives. He was only gone for three weeks, come on. But I realized that kind of like Julia Rogers, it wasn't all that scary outside of a few moments. Still, the concept of being trapped in your house for that long and resigning yourself to being there forever just because you're scared to leave is is pretty crazy, not gonna lie. At least now they can relate to speakerphone. My second choice is Tapped Out, the infamous breast milk episode that honestly deserves its own video at some point. Really, I don't find the episode that bad, except for the act three to four. Sorry, TPS has a weird airing schedule. But ultimately, besides like one or two moments, the episode's not scary. It's creepy. There's a big difference. If you like creepy, that's fine, you perv. But trust me, it was beaten out by far more scary candidates. And finally, the dentist's wife. You know, that episode where Roger becomes so obsessed with a woman named Meredith that he tries to take over her life and almost succeeds. Just saying, if you take away the plot line of Roger trying to find himself, it's still pretty scary regardless of how you slice it. Roger, what the hell did you do? 
Where's Meredith? Francine, everything's fine now. I put her on a barge, and now I'm her. You can't take someone's life like this. I wanted more than anything for this episode to be on the list. Like, this is why it's a top 11, not top 10. But alas, it was knocked back by stiff competition and can only serve as an honorable mention. All right, with that out of the way, let's move on to the actual list. You have to believe me, there's something wrong with Barry. Something evil. Fine, I'll open the door. When we get to church, nobody pray for Steve. Oh, another favorite line of Stan. And a beloved American Dad episode. Heck, it even got a great sequel of sorts in the TBS era. Steve's friend Barry... My name is Barry! Yes, I know you're Barry. Starts to spend more time with the family and takes a liking to Stan, doing all of the things with him that Steve normally won't. And Stan returns the sentiment. Besides, I've got Barry now. I don't need you, per se. You don't? Need me? Per se, Steve. Jeez, doesn't anyone appreciate Latin anymore? Well done, Barry. The thing is, Barry has to take special vitamins every day at a special hour. Time for my vitamin! Help, time to take my vitamin! Then comes a point when Stan tells Barry he's better off not taking them. I should run home and get more. You don't need those. Your little candy pills won't make you live forever, will they? Which, Stan, you never asked why Barry took those things. This is on you. He allows Barry to stay the night in Steve's room. Later, Barry reveals a secret to Steve. Go home. I don't think so, Steve. I like it here. Your voice, it's different. <gasps> oh my god, it's Craig Ferguson. He was in. He was in. You know what? I really don't know. I think How to Train Your Dragon. As it turns out, Barry is a yandere that puts Roger to shame. He wants Stan all to himself, not as a romantic partner, but just as a buddy, basically. And frames Steve as a cuckoo banana cream pie criminal in the making. God, the oven mitts. It was the oven mitts. I think he's dangerous. I did not! He's just- Look out! He's got a gun! Just to get him sent away to an oil rig. <gasps> Is Luann's daddy there? Oh yeah, that's right. Retcon. Screw you, Bretcon. And when Stan has to stop paying attention to Barry for five minutes just to pay attention to his own wife, Barry makes sure she can't bother them. Where's Francine? Uh, someplace she can't get between us anymore. Move over, Stan, you're freezing. No wonder she's so nonchalant. Roger did bury her alive that one time. But being buried alive is one of my biggest fears, so screw you, Barry. And when Stan wises up, he forces him, at gunpoint, to play games. Go ahead, play the card. But it'll send you back to start. I'm familiar with the rules, Stan. But... Play the card! At the oil rig, Steve learns that Barry's vitamins are not vitamins. They're actually medication meant to keep his violent tendencies in check by essentially turning him into Peter Griffin. Line up, munchwads! Time for your pills! What pills? The ones that <laughs> your aggressive criminal minds! Steve does get home and pulls a princess bride to save his family. Are you gonna choose a glass? Yes, I choose this one! Thanks for driving me home, Mr. Smith. We're going faster than people. Quiet, fatty, fat, fat, fatty! I think what makes this episode extra scary for me is how it came about. Normally, I hate the cliche where the main characters turn on one character to support another just to have a stupid moral about trusting your friends. Come on, Patch Boom Howard did this, My Little Pony did this, Funeral for a Fiend did this, but this is one of the few times I'm actually willing to forgive it. This was the point of the series where Steve started to make the move from wanting to follow in his father's footsteps despite being a nerd to being his polar opposite. Even at the start of the episode, they showed just how bored Steve was by everything. Look at me! I'm the dolphin tank cleaner! You save three seconds by not putting your clothes on him! I could totally buy Stan and Francine thinking that Steve is lashing out at his father. I don't know, what do you think? You better give me an answer now or I'm going to go bananas. Morning, Snowflake. What the hell are you doing, Roger? You're scaring me. 
No, 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 it's good. It's good. You know, I gotta say, I can get why some people hate Roger. If you guess by my video count, I don't. Even though I do think he gets away with way too much, especially when Jeff was in space. Like, not even a sorry. During this specific episode, Roger opens his own starlight lounge in the attic, because why would he go to the basement? And he invites Haley to participate as the headliner after hearing her sing. You perv! Get out of here! I'll leave after I tell you this. You just got a job singing in my lounge. Really? Shut up. Ugh, rude. He's gonna make her clean up after the show. The thing is, after one routine, Roger starts to fall in love with Haley. Like, full on. I think I love Haley. Dude, seriously? With Francine, Ken's, McGee strutting around this place? I know, Klaus. I have stuff I could say about Haley, but they would be highly inappropriate, and YouTube does not like that. However, as Steve puts it, it's probably not full-on love, just a schoolyard crush she'll probably soon get over. Relax. First of all, you're not in love. You just have a crush. Happens to me all the time. The good news is, it'll pass. Which kind of makes his actions all the more worse. And because special toys obviously cannot exist. Roger, they make them with USB chargers nowadays. <clears throat> Roger tries to purge his love of Haley, down to firing her. Well, he gets Klaus to do it and then, eh. Feeling guilty about the whole being fired thing, he eventually decides to simply come out and tell her the truth. It's just... Haley, I'm in love with you. What? Oh. Which Haley obviously rejects because she's married. And because he's never been rejected before, he freaks out by shooting her. Roger, what the hell are you thinking? I don't know. I was overwhelmed with emotion. So you shot me? Awful. So what? She shot me before. I've shot you a couple times. Everybody shoots everybody. It's how we communicate in this family. Oh. Okay, I guess it's just Roger's way of saying I love you. Well, that or him gifting her Christina Aguilera's larynx. Oh, get it away from me! Anyway, it's a really good gift because I love you. This isn't love, Roger. Yeah, huh? No comment. Haley obviously doesn't return the sentiment and tries to explain to Roger, like more gently than he probably deserves, why she won't love him. They, they want to spend time together. They want to be as close to each other as possible. Let's do that! We're gonna do your thing! Yeah, instead of accepting this, Roger abducts Haley from the hospital to take her to, I think, the ice factory from Franny 911, just so he can be near her at all times. Like John and Yoko. You're Yoko. Until he gets a much more brilliant idea. I want us to be one person, two hearts inside one skin. That's it! I'm gonna cut off your skin and drape it all over my body! Help! Yep. This is why it made the list. Uh, just saying. Just the build-up and everything. Roger acting super giddy does not help. Even if him being all happy reminds me of those people who make their own cosplays. Eventually, Jeff tracks down Roger before he can Ramsey Snow Haley. And while he does apologize, not really sure that would have helped matters, but okay, at least you're admitting your guilt, he decides to instead skin Jeff. Likely either because now he's bored of the idea of skinning Haley, or because he thinks Haley will love him, because now he will look like Jeff. This is the skin for me. Ah! Hey, babe, let's go try that weird skin that's like this. Oh, and that's not even the worst of it. After all of this, he gets bored. Yep, you heard that right. Bored. He just stops liking Haley just because. Meaning all of this was for nothing. Hey Jeff, good news, you're getting your skin back. Gross. <laughs> Scream. <laughs> They're everywhere. They're coming to get me. I wonder where she found that top. I mean, no! Pretty sure this was the show's first truly scary episode. In a way, Francine, as the wife of a guy like Stan, works primarily as a homemaker. And mostly, she's pretty happy and content with that role. I could not picture only spending your days cooking and cleaning, but if you want to do that, and it's your decision, and you can afford it, go ahead. Still, that doesn't mean Francine doesn't feel some regret. 
Especially this time around. During this episode, Francine starts to feel like her life has reached a super boring routine that Stan kind of enables. Well, more like forces. I just wanted to try something different. We will not be eating Thursday dinner on a Tuesday. This meal is canceled. <laughs> And thinks the only thing that'll improve it is getting in good with the ladybugs, a group of housewives. Oh, how I wish I could peel off your skin, put it on, and be you. I mean, hi. Plus, one of them is voiced by Sandra O, oh, and Roger named a drink after her. Francine learns that the ladybugs aren't just a housewife club, a la the Stepford Wives. They're a group of housewives who cheat on their husbands. It seems you have more in common with us than we thought. I do? The real reason we ladybugs get together is to compare notes on our affairs. Including Christy? But she's married to Chuck White. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Thank goodness they got rid of him. Ha ha! The ladybugs believe that Francine is cheating on Stan, and Francine rolls with it to become popular. After Linda guilts her into leaving, Francine tries to resign. I want out of the ladybugs. What? What? Only, it turns out the ladybugs are not all that happy with Francine skipping out on them and tells her that if she does not cheat on Stan, something bad will happen, i.e. they will kill her to protect their secrets in a highly gruesome way, plowing her down with runaway shopping carts. Ouch! Rack em up! And FYI, this is not the first time they did it. Previously, they did it to Anne Fleming. We wouldn't want you to end up like poor Anne Fleming. And even if it happened in public and in broad daylight, most nobody cares. Belong, nothing to see here. Just a woman crushed to death by a runaway train of shopping carts. Huh. Or is that something to see? Really, it's amazing just how far reaching the ladybugs are. Pretty much every married woman in town, except for Linda and Francine, are associated with them in some way, shape, or form. At one point, they get to her vacuum, her, her family, and her seasonings. Granted, part of me wonders if outside of the main free are all of those women really cheating on their husbands, or are they just more clever about it than Francine? Or do the ladies bugs have dirt on them. Regardless, Francine was this close to getting killed and Stan could not care less. My precious little man ran away, Francine. Has he been passed here? No, Stan. Okay, let's just do this. In a way, I feel what makes it worse is that the ladybugs appear in almost every episode from this point forward. Obviously, it's probably because it's cheaper to use them as background characters rather than design new ones. But that just makes it all the more creepier. They're always there. They're always watching. Just waiting for the moment Francine will slip up. Years ago, I looked into Mr. Javits's glowing red eyes. And I've been doing his heinous bidding ever since. And I never looked back unless I was bid to. You are here on this list, and so am I. Wait, that makes no sense. Whatever. If you did not know, in the United States, we have a lot of malls. I love the mall. In fact, the second biggest mall in the country is a $20 Uber from my house, because how dare they have a train route. I, for one, like to go to malls and work on scripts all day in the food court. Unfortunately, because of stuff like Amazon, most most malls are dying faster than a stand-up comedy routine put on by Squanchy. In 2020, there was a documentary released called Jasper Mall, focused on a man named Mike who served as a virtual groundskeeper at the titular mall in Alabama. The whole crux of the documentary was that the mall was slowly closing one by one and became a virtual wasteland. It seems as though American Dad saw it and thought, oh, we can do better. Just saying I noticed all the references. Steve needs to get a summer job and signs up to go work with Roger at the mall. However, the mall is dying and Steve decides to get new business there by hosting a food truck festival. Now, what makes American Dad a good show is the twist and this episode doesn't disappoint. Throughout the episode, Roger keeps referencing his superior and the mall's owner, Mr. Javits. Mr. Javits is the first person to ever trust me with this much responsibility. And when a great man shines his light on you, 
Wait, is that his name because of the Javits Center in Manhattan? You know, where they have Comic-Con? According to Roger, Mr. Javits is out looking for a new anchor tenant. You know, like Sears or Macy's or heck, even Primark. Only Mr. Javits never appears. And Steve assumes it's because he turned tail and ran. Mr. Javits abandoned the mall and he abandoned you. You don't know that. You don't know him! How could I? He's been gone for 25 years! Oh, don't worry. Mr. Javits is real. He's just not human. Mr. Javits is a warlock, Steve. This is why I was always calling him the Bone Man. Ooh, it looks like Cameron Diaz without her Cameron Diaz mask. And that's not all. It is built on an ancient evil spring, and whenever it gets hungry, the fountain awakens and I help it feed on the living. And let's not forget the mannequins. We've got a lot of mannequins lying around. You find any Lucy's, you throw them in here. And they turn out to be a reverse of the movie Mannequin. When Mr. Javits feeds the mall, anyone it consumes has their soul trapped here forever. Until my soul fades away and I become a mannequin. The mannequins were people? TV Trope says that this episode is like something out of a Stephen King story, and I could not agree more. If it had a sad ending, I would say that Mr. King should think of writing the story himself, or his own version. Because Mr. Javits has to feed the mall, this means that Steve's food truck festival is actually going to get tons of people, including his family and random strangers, killed. <laughs> The only saving grace is that Roger treats Mr. Javits wanting to hypnotize Steve like Steve's his side chick or something, not Roger. You are mine. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> and the fact that because this is a sitcom, there is kind of a happy ending, as Mr. Javits falls victim to the same mall he tried so hard to feed. I just want him to learn a lesson, you know? This fountain is the one thing that can destroy me forever! However, that doesn't take away from the fear factor and kind of makes you wonder just how far-reaching Mr. Javits has his oily warlock claws. Malls are closing all over the country. Is Mr. Javits gonna swoop down and take American Dream? Is that lady the Primark a ghost? You're gonna see a cautionary tale that may greatly influence your next hot tub purchase. Here we go. Now, American Dead is a show that has survived from the water and the fire. And that wasn't a pun, I just really like As I Lay Dying by Faulkner. Originally, this episode was written as a potential series finale, because around the time of production, the crew was sure they would get cancelled. As we know, the show survives to this day, meaning this was redconned as one of those non-canon episodes, like Rapture's Delight or Season's Beatings or stuff like that. Stan is beginning to feel stressed out by the mundane tedium of his stupid suburban life. So Principal Lewis refers him to a hot tub store. Well, well, well. And he buys a fancy one, which is not a time machine. Only the hot tub sounds like a musical man, and it's not Hugh Jackman. Yeah, that joke was bad and I should feel bad. Because Levi Stubbs has gone to meet his maker, that leaves CeeLo Green to take his place, both as the special voice and as the narrator, I guess. My name, it's not important. Ain't nobody got to know, just dip a toe. Wait, you can talk? I can do a whole lot more than talk, baby. Yep, this episode is the show's take on Little Shop of Horrors. And as a major fan of Little Shop, I love it. Off topic, but I remember Family Guy did their own parody, but with Chris's pimple. That episode wasn't scary, but boy was it funny. Much like Audrey 2, the hot tub, which I don't think has a name, so I'm just gonna continue calling it the hot tub, entices Stan and Francine into it by using the opportunity to spice up their personal lives to the point where they neglect all else. I sat outside school like an idiot for over four hours. Then I walked home like a like an animal. Do you even care? I mean, did you even pick Roger up from soccer practice? Francine realizes her mistake 
and decides to simply use the hot tub in moderation. Meanwhile, Stan decides to do whatever he likes, even if it causes him to become a loser, potentially lose his job, and abandon his family, just to have random booty calls with insecure chicks from the grocery store. When Stan starts to have doubts about his new lifestyle, the hot tub decides to kill Francine. You call her! I didn't call it. <gasps> Hot tub! <laughs> and virtually succeeds. Stan! No! And also Marguerite and Lewis when they try to interfere. Stan himself learns the truth behind the hot tub and fruitlessly tries to save Francine. Well, there you have it. That's our story. Stan's dead. Good night. My only gripe with the episode is that while it's good as a non-canon what if, it's a terrible finale. I don't mind the fact they killed off everybody, it's just there's like no closure. Haley and Jeff barely do anything. Heck, Haley doesn't even get any lines. Roger and Steve do have a good song, but that's about it. Just saying, if they wanted it to be a definite no coming back finale, why not have the Smiths try to save Stan and they all die in the process? Or like the source material, perhaps to make Stan happy, the hot tub starts to pick them off one by one until it's only him and Francine. Or maybe it needs blood to function or human flesh or something like that. Also, one nitpick, not a gripe, a nitpick. Those are different. We learn the hot tub came to life because it was struck by lightning. They banned it because some tubs, when they get struck by lightning, they come alive. The hot tub is alive and it escaped from a mental institution. Even though that's not why Audrey 2 is the way he is. Or she, because plants. Audrey 2 came to Earth through a total eclipse of the sun and is a mean green mother from outer space. The hot tub is artificial, but the episode was pretty good. I guess I could ignore it. Obviously, this is one of the show's most divisive episodes, but that doesn't take away from its scary factor. During the episode, we learn that the reason the Smiths haven't had a pet, who wasn't Klaus or Roger, was because Stan was traumatized by having to old yeller his perfectly healthy dog, Freddy, when he was a child. No. My mom said to. Turns out Freddy wasn't even sick. They just didn't allow dogs at our new apartment building. Okay, that's tragic, but why couldn't Betsy just give it away or give it to a shelter? Or if she didn't care that much, why not just let him go on the street? And since during my last video, I was Catherine for Halloween, time for some whining. Catherine style. Didn't they have pets all those other times? Got Steve an old dog that peed dust and you killed it. We also had another dog named Fussy that you didn't like. Francine, those were obviously dreams. Eh, makes sense. The newer episodes kind of established that there is a multiverse of sorts. Francine tries to help Stan overcome his trauma by buying the family a new dog named Kisses, who Stan takes a liking to. Oh my god, what a cute little yawn, what a tired little baby. Oh, it hurts. It really hurts. But just question. Is Kisses his name because of Kissy Kisses, like mwah 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 mwah? Or because of the chocolates? Or both? What makes this episode less worthy is the victim they chose. That's right, victim. And it's not Stan. It's Kisses. Kisses is just a normal dog that did not hurt anybody and had a good time living with a family that loved him. And for that, he gets viciously mauled and murdered rather than just get super sick or hit by a car like most dogs. Cats don't hate dogs, we don't hate dogs. Those cats who hate dogs, they're supremacists. They're like Stryker. I'm not Stryker, I'm more like Vizzarali. Italian, a performer, have a past I'd rather not look back on. Not helping is Roger's reaction. No! This is an unfortunate situation. 
Um, what's a word that rhymes with sick? However, despite the damage being apparent, Stan refuses to let kisses go gentle into that good night, like literally everybody is telling him, and discovers a doctor who could help, Dr. Lizzie. And you know she's a good doctor when you call her by her first name. Plus, let's not forget she sounds like a certain pink cat with an adopted porcupine daughter. Stan drives with kisses to Dr. Lizzie's and allows her to operate on him. And do you want to see the end result? No. Too bad. Kisses! Come on, boy! <laughs> you know, I can't voice my complaints because I honestly don't know what to say. So, I'm gonna have the characters in universe say it. Oh! Oh my god! Please kill this dog! End this! Yeah, no wonder this episode is near universally hated. Not only does Dr. Lizzie turn kisses into a freak of nature that's spending the rest of its life, possibly short life, living in agony, but there's also what she did to his car. $6,000? Well, I also fixed her car. Eventually, yes, Dan does put kisses down after a heartfelt dream with his childhood dog, Freddy, not Sparky. But why did we have to sit through this train wreck of an episode? Ugh, moving on. Now tell me, Francine, how do I look? I am loving your stupid fedora. Mmm. A little more hypnosis. Do you know the difference between Klaus Heisler and Klaus Michelson? Whenever you try to Google anything about Klaus, you end up getting results for Klaus Michelson, not Klaus Heisler. And only one of those mother effers is actually animated and a man in a fish's body. But the true worst part about Klaus is the fact that he's kind of evil, despite the abuse he suffers through during Beyond the Alcove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Klaus, Francine hosts a dinner party, and Klaus ends up razzle-dazzling everybody. Oh, would you do your Will Arnett impression again? I really should. Oh, come on! <laughs> <laughs> He's awesome, because everything is awesome. Francine is perplexed because how could he be doing that? He's Klaus. Klaus says it's because he follows the teachings of Mark Wahlberg. This is crazy. There's no way Mark Wahlberg does all that. And then some. He's a big old Catholic. No comment. Francine tries it herself, but continues to pry until Klaus eventually reveals the truth. People don't like him because he's awesome and everything is awesome. They like him because they're hella brainwashed. Kind of like Get Out. Have you seen the movie Get Out? No. Really? Francine, you undereducated pleb. At least you probably never watched Nope. Good for you, you don't have to feel nauseous for the next two weeks like some of us were. Grinning, uh, this makes sense. So instead of discussing things with me, you take me to a hypnotist? So this whole plot line fits Klaus like a slipper. Klaus also happened to have brainwashed Jeff into becoming this. First, I learned all about Jeff, what makes him tick, so to speak and I discovered that Jeff really likes weed. I do! Gotta say though, while horrific, Jeff is really rocking that maid cafe cosplay. If the episode just stuck to Klaus brainwashing the family and maybe a few friends and neighbors, that's pretty standard. Remember when the Smiths were so sore they couldn't move? But that's not what he did. Francine is taken away from Langley Falls for two months and ends up at an Airbnb. When she gets back, she learns that Klaus brainwashed the whole freaking town into loving him. Not just love as in like a celebrity, as in like he's practically the mayor. Who doesn't love Klaus? Francine Smith. <gasps> Oh, if only I could do that. Imagine how many watch hours I would get. Still, by everyone in town, I literally mean everyone, including her family and Sky Crooner. Tell me you haven't fallen for Klaus! <laughs> Francine discovers there is a way to reverse the hypnotism. You just have to say one specific phrase. Enough with the hypnotism already. 
It's a good one. Fiendishly simple. She says it, but too bad. No offense, honey, but hypnosis showed me how cool Klaus is. Honestly, he deserves to be dictator of Langley. Maybe you should try thinking Klaus is cool. You just might find you like it. Okay, that's freaky. Imagine being so brainwashed you begin to just accept it. The only reason Francine saves the town is sheer luck, as she plays Klaus's podcast and reminds everybody he sucks like a fish. Meanwhile, I'm trying to protect a bachelorette party from some creep I hear them whispering about. But the girls won't tell me what floor their room is on. Moving on. Ah! Am I early for book club? No, you're late. And that's two weeks in a row. You're out. I didn't read it anyway. <sighs> Screw every other episode. This is Roger at his freakiest. Why? Because he has ears. Freaking ears. And eyebrows as big as caterpillars. Steve is participating in the school's talent show. And because Lewis won't let him sing, he has to do something else. Plus he also has to get back at AJ, who unlike him, was picked to sing. Roger suggests that he could... One word. Ventriloquy. Ventriloquism? Puppet talking. And Roger would be the dummy. Never ever call me a dummy. The word dummy is degrading. I am a manually articulated performative kinesio maquette. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I didn't know that offended you, Roger. You know what? I'll call you Dudley. I'm so sorry. But first things first. Painful prosthetics to give me fully flappable eyebrows and ears. I inject just a skosh of paralyzing agent into my arms and legs. I have to apply several layers of this pungent lacquer face paint. This is important. Their practice performance goes off without a hitch, and they're allowed to be in the talent show. The brakes on Carla's bike somehow gave out, and she crashed right into the flagpole! Oh, that's oddly creepy. Sounds like she took a tumble. Damn it, Roger. But yes, Roger, as Dudley, tries his hardest to help Steve by killing or harming the competition in ways that look like freak accidents. And yeah, it's par for the course for Roger to want to be violent to get results, but normally, if he's told by Steve not to do something like that, he'll normally respect his wishes, even at the beginning of the episode. After he was sabotaged, Steve said he did not want to get revenge. Deny it all you want, but deep down you want to get back at AJ and you want to win that show. I admit, it'd be nice to see AJ get what he deserves. Hence the necessity of needing Dudley. But as Dudley, Roger took out the bully... <laughs> If they only stuck to the bully, that would be fine. He was already a D-word to start with. Maybe the episode could be about grudges, I don't know. But Roger takes out literally everybody involved in the talent show, including Barry and Snot, just to narrow the playing field. Plus, what's worse is this is not the first time Roger has done something like this through his Dudley persona. Dudley and I were on Hollywood Squares. And he started killing all the other celebrities, just so we could sit center square. Now, you might be wondering why Roger is doing this. Well, it goes back to the pain. In a way, it's not Roger doing it. Industrial airplane paint. Inhalation may cause temporary psychosis. All I have to do is get that makeup off you, and everything will go back to normal. When Steve won't perform, Roger injects him with a paralyzing agent and forces him to perform against his will. You wanted to get back at AJ. You wanted to win the talent show. Don't you see? Dudley Dingleberry was inside you. It's showtime. On the bright side, Steve does win the talent show, as the judges assume he's doing a bit. Afterwards, he does try to stop Roger. <laughs> Code. Lies. While Roger is freed from the psychosis at the end, he tries to make sure the makeup can't cause harm ever again. rather than just throwing it away. Oh, and that's not all. There's also a terrible subplot where Francine gets hay fever, and Stan forces Haley to pump her full of bees and wasps, until she looks like this. Dad, I'm a little worried about Mom. 
She's fine. Just swab her with a little more of our patented homemade poultice. Available in the lobby. Not all that is old was once young. Not all that's forgotten is gone. Fun fact, American Dad has gotten cancelled and uncancelled several times. And recently, it was almost on the chopping block. During the merger between Warner Brothers and Discovery, they tried to use American Dad as a tax write-off by having Disney cancel the series. Because it's still produced by Fox which is owned by Disney. It just airs on TBS. This was in spite of the fact it still had at least two more seasons worth of episodes per contract, and it was TBS's highest rated program. Thankfully, that did not come to pass, but the writers got scared and wrote a series finale just in case. During Echoes, Steve has to do a work-study program, and he has two options, either work at the news station or do something stupid at a urology clinic. Stan suggests he should do it at the news station with Memphis Stormfront, aka not Terry, even though I think he's perfectly fine. I feel you, Steve. Big dreamers like you and me, we gotta spread our golden wings. One day we hit that open road and never look back. Granted, I am all in agreement with Stan. Would you really want to spend an entire week looking at jars of pee? Much like You Are Here made fun of dead moles, this episode makes fun of the Doppler radar, which is a tool meteorologists use to predict the weather. Besides that, fun fact, there is a twist ending, which I very much like to spoil. Memphis reveals that the news station, or more specifically him, don't actually use ugh, predictions or equations or science or anything like that to predict the weather or tell you the news. The Doppler radar provides everything, as Steve himself witnesses. <laughs> Steve believes that in order to stop this horrible future from happening, as guided by Memphis, then comes the reveal. The orb wasn't waking the Nameless One. It was the only thing keeping it asleep. And now, thanks to you, Bethazalon rises! Steve, you freaking idiot. However, you remember how hot water led to Stan's death and implicitly Francine's? It makes no mention of the rest of the Smiths, so you could just say they survived. Well, this episode all but says that the entire family was killed. There's no possibility the others could take down the hot tub themselves or have good lives now or anything like that. Literally, this ending is probably one of the show's bleakest. They just sit there in their car, realizing there's nothing they can do but just sit together as a family and wait for the end to happen. It's too late. This really is the end of everything. Good thing, either because multiverse, or maybe Steve was envisioning all of this, whatever you want to call it, maybe that was the echo he was hearing. Everything is fine, as far as we know. Looks like I'll be taking my talents to the Buckle Group's cash-only walk-in urology center. Just saying, maybe the Smith family we follow after this episode are different and the real ones were killed, or maybe those were alternate Smiths, in which case, yeah, it sucks they died, but maybe it's slightly better. Six of one. I promised my family the three Fs. Francine, frog, food. Greg's in there, eat him. Uh, no. He smells. Fun fact, this was the episode that got the dentist's... I can't say dentist. Fun fact, this was the episode that got the Meredith episode kicked off the list. Now, I'm sure we can all agree that there are times when we feel left out or excluded. And while it does suck, I'm sure we all know that the people in our lives do care for us. Maybe it's just bad timing, or hey, stuff happens. However, that feeling of being left out does suck, and it feels like you're being trapped alone in a slimy enclosure of frog eggs and tadpole fetuses. During the free Fs, Francine starts to feel left out by her family, especially when they refuse to join her in having a pool party. On such a beautiful day. <laughs> gotcha! Doesn't the pool look so nice? Why don't you join me? I'm just out here because I got ketchup on my toes. They only start to pay attention to her after she finds a frog. She names the frog Jumpers. Oh! Hi, 
there, little froggy. They're too heavy! If we don't drop some cargo, we're dead, man! Dude, they're falling right out of the sky. They need to drop the load. The only one who objects to jumpers is Greg. I'm trying to get 18 hours of sleep a day to prepare for an audition next week. A scout is coming to watch me perform the news, and it could be my big break to go national. This'll be important later. Of course, the family quickly tires of jumpers because he's a novelty to them. Afterwards, he reveals a secret to Francine. He can talk, maybe. But speaking of the voice thing, they imply several times that Jumpers isn't actually talking. Well, yes, he is bad news. Francine is apparently hallucinating all of this. Or maybe, who knows, perhaps he can talk, but chooses to only talk to her. Is mom talking to Jumpers? Uh, rabbit. Both options are freaky. Plus, there's also a bunch of other frogs for her to spend time with. Oof. Come on! My family's gonna love this! Francine starts to obsess over jumpers, even if his noise and antics are driving the neighbors crazy. Greg tries to take Francine to court, and despite getting proof of the frogs, this happens. Do you have evidence? Yes! Listen to these frogs! March 12th, sibilance practice. Well, I don't understand. I checked it this morning. CeeLo, do your thing. Oh, damn! I know, right? Eventually, Francine kicks the whole family out of the house and makes the frogs her new family, refurbishing the house for them. Francine's men. Ma'am, are you okay? I'm gonna call someone for you. <laughs> The Smiths want to help her and go to a herpetologist at Croft Community College, who reveals the truth about jumpers. He's from Amphibia. No, he's not. He's a Brazilian cuckoo frog. Frogs surround this animal and shower it with attention until the animal is so entranced that it leaves its own pack and joins the frog army. And he wants to prepare Francine as a meal for his bebes. Frogs make a foam nest to lay their eggs in, and the animal offers herself up to the newly hatched tadpoles who devour her from the inside out. Excuse me? And because Francine thinks the frogs are making her feel needed, she's totally willing to surrender herself and accept this fate. I want them to, because they're my family. It is time. Adios. The Smiths track her down where we get this. Hi, little guy. Well, now I'm a tad concerned. They apologize for how they treated her, and now she doesn't want to be fed to the babies. Good thing someone else does. It's been my life's dream to be the first human sacrifice for the Brazilian cuckoo frog. This works. No, I... What makes this episode extra scary for me is the paranoia fuel. Imagine ignoring somebody once, and you probably don't mean it, or mean for them to take it personally. But for whatever reason, they do. And something crazy happens, and you think it's all your fault. You could replace jumpers with, say, an abusive partner, a cult, and it would probably stick. The worst for me is the frog noises. Ugh, all the frog noises, noises. Noises. Plus, unlike most of the other entries, this episode doesn't have a subplot. Normally, the fear factor, for me at least, can be a little bit mitigated when we have something else to turn to. Here, there's nothing. It's just Francine and frogs. We're trapped with it, and so are the Smiths. Still, this episode is one of my personal favorites, and I am quite happy I got to include it. Welcome, Nighthawks. We've been expecting you. Oh, come on. You knew this episode was gonna be number one. You knew before you even clicked on the video or thought about watching this video or the fact it could possibly exist that this was gonna be number one. Look, I get requests all the time to talk about this episode. And even if it's not one of my 
favorites, I will still say it's probably the scariest episode overall. And I do get chills whenever I watch it. Much like Hot Water, Stan starts to hate his life. He thinks his family doesn't appreciate him. Because you don't. I mean, you harpooned your wife. Oh, now you know how Francine felt. He goes out during bulk and finds a giant TV. Like one of those old TVs. Really old TVs. Not one of those TVs you had in school during stormy weather. That big TV that Spongebob bought with Patrick just to play with the box. Stan takes it into the basement and finds that he can only really watch one channel. Nighthawk's Hideaway, starring Alistair Kovacs. I'm Alistair Kovacs, your host for a sophisticated little soiree with jazz. Stimulating conversation, beautiful ladies. It's him, the scariest guy in all of American Dead. That dude looks like Stan with a normal sized chin. The show's primarily about Alistair hosting an old fashioned party, and there's nothing to it. Two years in, are we any better off with Hawaii Estate? If the Ruskies got control of that lava? <gasps> An introvert's nightmare. And it's the 40s, 50s, 60s, so there's no cell phone you could use to pass the time. Stan is intrigued by the show, but finds out that apparently it doesn't exist, even if little changes always happen each airing. People always want to know more about it, but there is no record of its existence. And I saw a 1960s show called Nighthawk's Hideaway. There's no such show. Show. There's never been such a show. Because Stan isn't in contact with Blame It on George, nor does he probably have a Reddit account, he ends up attending a support group for fans of the show, who meet to compare notes. Where's everybody else? There used to be more people, but one by one, they stopped coming. <sighs> Before we go any further, I gotta make a connection. A few years ago, there was a creepypasta that got popular called Candle Cove. Kinda like rabbit ears, it was about a group of people talking about a show there was apparently no history of existing. Only for the ending to imply that, yeah, the show never existed to begin with. Those kids were just watching static. Well, this episode turned me into a fan of that short story, it made me wonder if perhaps the episode was going to proceed like that. Maybe only a couple people can see it for some reason. Maybe the show never existed and Stan was just having a daydream of what could have been. Maybe it was a CIA experiment. None of that happens. As it turns out, people become so obsessed with the show that it literally swallows them whole. Hmm. Cannonball! Welcome, Nighthawk. And once you get into the show through the TV, you can't get out. Worse yet, it's kind of like Hades Town or the Realm of Magic, where the longer you're there, you forget who you are and everything that came before. Oh, it's the rerunning. We just keep rerunning. I remember less each time. I'm forgetting my life, Sam. If you try to escape or go off script, this happens to you during commercial break. <laughs> Stan and Tuttle try to escape, but every time it seems like they're leaving, they find out they're still trapped. Eventually, Stan manages to make his way back home, after several tries. Yes. No! That's right! American Dad is now a show that exists on TV in the basement of the family of American Dad. And that's how it ends. Stan never escapes. He's trapped there forever. It's kind of like the theory that Rapture's Delight was canon. Are we just watching Stan on a TV now? Is American Dad, like, a Turk Duncan, basically? What makes Alistair especially scary is we don't know where he came from or why he's doing what he's doing. We do know he wants people to be part of his show, but why? Who made him? Is he supernatural? What's going on? And kind of like Candle Cove, that makes it all the more better. We don't know why, and wondering why is better than knowing why. Another great episode, so long, Nighthawks.